Do you remember all these pictures? Yeah, I sure remember that. I remember clearing land there. The good thing Dad bought a cat. Yeah. That was the hard. You first you cut the trees down, and you cut them in a windrow. You see, so, and but you took the saw logs out, and but the top was there. But you picked up by hand and all that stuff. Then you took the horses and you pulled the little stumps with the chain that they could pull. And when they couldn't pull, you put a, a cable and a block on, half left they call it, an anchor stump out there and a cable around it. And that doubled your power, see, to pull the uh, stumps. And when you c couldn't do that anymore, you had to blow them. And that might sound thrilling, but it was darn expensive, though. The dynamite wasn't bad, but the fusion caps you had to have for every charge. If you use a half a stick or ten sticks, the same amount of fusion caps you had to use, and you had to use so much food. We used to set eight stumps, punch a hole in the steel bar, but once you got the whole punch with the steel bar, you did away with that, you used wood. You never used steel against the dynamite, ever. You know, nothing made of steel because of uh, the danger of a spark. And, uh, but stumps that the horses couldn't pull, and pine especially would have a ton or more of soil clinging to the roots, and you had to grub that all off. But a shot down out of there. It didn't blow the stump out, but it blew the soil away so the team could pull the thing. If you wanted to blow it out, you had to put more powder in there, of course, it cost you money. And uh, we loaded stumps with anywhere from half a stick, well, up to 25 sticks for a big old fishbowl stump. And the kid used to get a great thrill of watching that thing <laughs> go way up in the air. <laughs> Uh, but it, there were all first growth that were in this country, none now, but there were a few up on the farm that they'd been cut down too. Uh, but they were oh, 300 years old or so, very close by, very big trees and big roots, fir with big roots. And you couldn't pull them with the horses at all, no hope. So you had to blow them, soil up from underneath them. But, or, Better still, a lot of them are so well rooted you, you had to blow them right out of there because it'd be so much trouble to pull them out. But you had to buy that charge every time and money wasn't very plentiful. But I spent every bare ground day trying to make the ranch, but as soon as it snowed off into the bush to cut the tree down. Of course, in earlier days, these days, we cut the tree down sometime too, uh, in, into minerals and piled the brush and everything. That, I remember that there, that's the old barn there. And I remember that, we cured that. And I remember pulling stumps in there and uh, it took a long time. If you cleared an acre a year, you did pretty darn good. So it took a long time to make a farm. Did that dad got a cat and we <laughs> I don't know. I think later on it clear an acre an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the well, the woodlot the farm was um the the farm was the land that went in so that you could get the woodlot that was all behind the farm? The the land that was three quarters. The homestead was one and a soldier's grant was the second quarter. And we bought the Jones place, quarter closer right there, and the woodlot was the fourth quarter. See, so it made a square. That's, that's why the farm is called, well, anyway, I the four, four by four. That was a brand, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah, and that was why four quarters. Okay. Yeah. What about the next picture? What's that one? Do you know who that is? That's old Harry Wells that he comes on there. <laughs> yeah, that, that, the Wells place, you know, up the hill from 
your, your hatches, hatchy, the hatch place was there, and the hind place in the in between there, and that's the welded place there. And I remember him very well. He cut those. That's the first school tree, and he cut them down for wood and bucked them into blocks with the cost cuts up. He, him and the hired man did that every spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, took a couple of weeks. Yeah. And that's Dennis Clark. He, on the 15 mile hill, the Clark place. Mm -hmm. He had a German mother. She settled there before the war and she was married to, she was a well educated lady very well. And then she ma was married to an English, well, teacher, teacher's what it was, a different name for it, I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. But he tried to get them to go to school, and they thought they, that was when I was very, very young, before I ever went to school. But he tried to get them to go to school, and they thought they should have a lady teacher, so he couldn't get it. So he went to the Peace River and was taught there for the rest of his days. And this is when he was a logger, when he was younger, and, uh, that way? Or, and, or logging and that's in his place. logs that Dennis cut himself with a crosscut saw. Mm -hmm. He didn't get much done. He never never went to school, but the old lady taught him everything except he had very well mannered, very well mannered. Joyce and Ben Fisher started to graduate in town. He went to town and he knocked on the door. He didn't know he just walked right in. He went to town on the train from that murder seat because there was no, no other way to get there. He couldn't drive a car or anything. And that's Jess and Mabel Bingham building a um, Bullpen out back of the mine, but a little house for the bull shelter. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing there. They peeled the logs. And, uh, tough girls. This <laughs> tough work, but they were in their teens and they were doing it though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she lived in the valley. Yeah, and that I remember that very. That's Jess on top of that same building. Uh, when it gets higher, but that's Jess and me and my mother. Granny. And how tall was Granny? Yeah. How tall was Granny? She, she weighed 98 pounds. <laughs> she, I don't know. She was just short. She was one of the shortest women I ever knew, actually. Yeah, and there she is throwing blocks of uh, firewood or something. Oh, yeah. And she, oh, she was wonderful. Hard work all her life. She was orphaned at 13 years old in England, see, and so she had it. She married my father in 1917, and she and her Sid Sylvester, he was her son, and granddad's mother came to Canada. She and Sid and mother came to Canada in 1919 onto the farm, but granddad had Staked it out. He came out of the army and staked it out in 1918, but he was in pretty bad shape from the army, so he didn't get much done. But that sawing wood and that engine, I gave it to all that customer there at McMurdo. It's a nine horsepower Fairbanks Morse. What it is. Mm -hmm. and, and the remember gasoline, of course. Yeah. And, and that's how we cut the wood. Easier than a crosscut saw. You sure would better than a crosscut saw. Huh? But it wasn't as good as a chainsaw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My father would, did some work on that. He wasn't able to work very much, but he helped me with that. They were pit props for the British mines. They, throughout the war, the mines were all lined with wood, and throughout the war they'd never been replaced, so they were replacing them. That, they were pit props, seven feet long and nine feet long and they had to be peeled, and they're made of pine, because they peel nicely, you know. And they peel them with machines now, but we had to peel them in the peeling season in the spring, from April, it was all finished over by the 1st of July, you couldn't peel after that. But there was good money in them, and they were shipped to England, of course, I remember, I remember the old guy in Cranbrook. And, but they did a lot of work, they were a lot of work. And is that your truck running the mill, uh, running the saw there? I can't see who that 
Is it two girls? Let's see. I don't know, but I think it's got the name on the door of the truck. There. Oh, that's the number weight. It's a half ton, 0.5 ton maximum camming capacity. And you got the back end lifted up there with a strap around yeah, the axle. That's a, a, a wheel jack. You, you built it in steel and it was two, two, two pulleys and a center one that held the belt. And then the two, the tire sat on the two center ones. It was a built frame and you backed the truck right onto that. And in high gear, 20 miles an hour, it powered a wood saw. It never hurt the truck very much, and, uh, but everything had to be lifted to it and everything else. Mm -hmm. It was hard work, but we cut wood for the market that way too, you know. And uh, it was an improvement. It was a big improvement over that engine, really. But these are not. These are tie blocks, eight foot tie blocks, and I cut them with a sweet saw because the old fellow that had the Kelly place next door, he came there when I was very young from Alberta, and he had a nice big Swede saw with a steel frame. I think the thing is still at home. And you know, one man with those cross cut saws is murder. That you, you don't get anywhere. But that Swede saw would cut like a razor, boy. And, but the one thing is, you always had to have a spare and it could be sure you wedge it because you'd break the blade so easily and then you'd have to sharp it again. But the blade was four feet long, see? So you cut, cut these all with it. And you cut them in the bush and skin them with a the horse because now, they, later on, they used a cat to pull the whole tree up. You couldn't do that. The horses can't pull the whole tree. You see? So you had to make the logs in the bush, and cut them up in the bush, and then skid them out with the horse. We had tongs, a chain. You, go, you have a, a log and chain, put around two of them. Well, round one, and then half hitch on the other one. Or if it was big tongs, and tongs were still at home yet, big set of timber tongs. And that was simple, you hook onto any log. And you could be one horse or a team could get a nice heavy ring, big steel. They, they, be, they haven't been used for, oh God, I don't know how many years. <laughs> yeah. And that's more, that's more than this granny. She came for, they, they were just up the road toward toward Lyles. Oh, you know where the creek comes down beyond the fields? The creek came down there, the culvert, they called it all through the years. It went down there and went down right down to like motor school. Um, and that's where they were. But I cut these in the bush and I, I didn't cut anything down that wouldn't make three big, a tree big enough to make three ties because preserve the timber. Uh, it would grow and later on you cut the tree and you cut it off at, at 20, uh, t t no, three inch, 24 feet, cut it off at 24 feet and nine inch top and that left a nice big log in the bush from the top really, but it was sometimes not worth skinning it out, it wasn't worth enough, but those three type tree and that had to be nine inch top to make it big enough for ties. Uh, but it left a lovely tree standing beside it wasn't quite big enough. And that grew in pretty short order. Once they get more light, they grow even faster. And down in our country here, they, they sure grow. South of Spun Machine, they don't grow. They go up a little bit and then bush out for bad. They don't do them the mountain. Anything. Back in the mountains, they, back in the hills, they grow up. Out in the valley here, they didn't. It's all bushy, and but it's a lot, many, many hours of work in that, all by hand. And Granny used to go up and have a look. <laughs> That's your dad. <laughs> that Dennis Clark there, and that wasn't at our place at all. That was his. Place. 
but that's your dad on our skidding horse to skid those things out, you know. He used to go up and enjoy sitting on that darn horse. He'd be surprised how long he'd sit on there, too. Yeah. I remember he was a little, he used to, pretty active, he could just walk around my nicely. And I remember one winter he was missing from the house. And his mother was all excited and didn't know where he'd gone. And I don't know. I don't know. But our cows had to go to Kelly to get water. That's I, um, a mile south. It was my mile trail over there. It was a, not a wagon road, really, but it was a trail. But couldn't find him. And I, the cows had gone for water, and I followed, and I see these little tracks in behind. He'd follow the darn cows. And it's just a little thought, you know. And got to the, just about to Kelly's field, you go up that steep hill, and here he comes screaming down that hill. <laughs> he finally went realized he'd gone too far from home, I guess. He was just a little fella. <laughs> he came screaming down that hill. He, and I had to carry him home, of course. <laughs> he followed the cows over there, but <laughs> I'll never forget that. He was, but he sat on that, he sat on the horse whenever he could come out. Yeah. That's, that's me and Harold Rowe right there, but there was a Bob Bam Oh, Wellstead, the Wellstead place, next to the Hatch place there. Neville owned it, I think, yeah. But the old man died, and the old lady was stuck with the hay crop, so the three of us decided to put the hay up for them. And that's, that's what we were doing, that's their Wellstead team. Uh, but I was actually working at Parson, but it was Saturday and Sunday to do this, and, and Harold had a little job somewhere too. And that, he's taken this uh, back apart and in the cedar swamp up there, he'd come down at Beards Creek, three miles out. Uh, but they put the logs on there, uh, one third ahead and two third dragging the ground, so the front end was up and the back end was dragging the ground. But there was a secret to be, you put a base of logs and two side logs each side. And then you put a chain on there, not too tight, but put a chain on it when your log come on it. To fill, fill the space in, you tighten the chain. And so it was safe, was safe. And we could go down across the road at Thomas's and right across the railroad track and dump them on the river. On the ice, it wasn't in the ice, of course, it was frozen. But I, that was, I had one and another old fella had the other one. They had teams just got old because the young people didn't like to get up early in the morning, that much earlier and work on them late at night. But when I drove horses for, for a long time, and of course I learned to drive them at home so it was no problem. But you get fond of them, you know, and then you work them hard. And you have to look after them, you have to look after the shoulders because you mustn't have them laid up. And you, a horse with a sore shoulder, he, what he'll do, he'll favor it. And then he'll injure the muscles on that side, and it's called Sweeney. And he can never do heavy work if that go after that. Go, it's a Sweeney. So you avoid a Sweeney, and you check the shoulders every night and wash them if necessary and always watch for a sore spot. And if you didn't have a sore spot, you could have the collar would have a, a pad, that big uh, sweat pad they called them. And you cut a little hole in it where that sore spot was so it keep the pressure off. Because you, you must avoid a Sweeney. Your company didn't like you getting a Sweeney. <laughs> but you, you have to take good care of them. And when you're driving horses, and especially the older fellas, get very, you had to work them hard, and it was brutal work that log, and it was terrible. But you, you, you thought a lot of your horses, and you looked after them the best way you could, you know. But they had to work hard. You, you had to. You wouldn't be there if you didn't. But these were just farm horses, of course, because we were putting that hay up on the weekends. 
but yes, they were just sitting out there on a Sunday. We had to work six days a week, and and I took that picture on a Sunday. I took that picture with, because yeah. we had a road to go down, and a road the canyon, and a, a road for everybody to come up over the hill because you couldn't meet anybody when you had horses pulling that sloop with the logs on because you couldn't stop them. They sanded the steep part of the hills where the sand monkeys sanded the steep part to hold them back a little bit, but the horses had to hold them back, you know, they were pushing on heavy. Uh, and that's me, and plowing the, the road over the hill from Madden's house, you know, go over the jack pine down the hill, that's down there, and plowing the hill, and that's a big cedar log split in half, and they like that first no plow. And, oh, it didn't do much of a job, but you had to put chains on everything anyway. And of course, four wheels weren't invented yet anyway. So, uh, but that was what that was, plowing the road down, and plow all the way to the valley road like that. Uh, it took a long time for the grader to come and my father ran the car, well, not all winter, not all winter, I had to put them on block. The old-fashioned tires, you had to put them up on block, you couldn't let the car sit them all winter long, or else that flat never got out of them. And, you know, <laughs> well, it was a long story about those old tires, I'll tell you. <laughs> when women first started to drive, well, of course, they always, some always will, but when they, on the road, they'd get flat tires quite often, you always had to stop them help them change that tire, and that was quite a job, you know. I had to take it off the wheel <laughs> and uh, pump it up again with a hand pump too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's Clifford Hayward in the field near home below the road, just below Granny's house, where the land was cleared, and the Haberts were logging next door over Kelly Place, and my dad got Clifford to bring that cat, and just comb it to smooth it off. We only had horses, see, and the cat was big, and it wasn't a big cat, but, and of course, it didn't have hydraulics. It had uh, uh, a, lever, a lever, a power shaft, and it had cables on it to pull them out with cable and drop them, and gravity. Nope, we couldn't push down on it, of course, because of gravity. Howard changed that cat and put hydraulics all on it, and it quite a job, but he did it, so you had hydraulic power, so you could push it down, and you didn't have all this frame here. But him and Howard were in partnership quite a long time, and then he, Howard, had ideas, and he didn't want to stay with it, so. But Clifford, he left Howard, and Howard, they were alone, and then he never really did much. He invented things. That Bud Hope, in 1960, Down Creek brought rocks and everything down all around the house and everything. And Bud would log in nearby with a cat, and I got him, him there to push, push, push the thing back. Dad didn't have a big cat at that time. Uh, and if he did, it wouldn't be home anyway. But I got butt on the cat. He, he, that's why the hill is behind the house at home, that hill. Now, he couldn't push it very far. Your dad, if he had a D8, would have put that right back in the bush, but he couldn't do it with that. I was, I was only a nine, I think. Uh, and, and, but I, I appreciated him. And I told him if he would help me do that, I'd give him a beef for the winter. And so I had a calf. And then that worked out good. Didn't have to give him cash. Give him a calf Google. The snow came, and it was a big animal and nice and fat. And they had beef for the winter. Good deal. <coughs> That's my sister, Phyllis, when she was just a little dog. Mm -hmm. And so she. She died here just a few years ago at 83 or 84, so that was... She was born in 1926, so that'll tell you how old that picture is. Yeah. And that dad, 
on the apple tree at Granny's house, when we built Granny's house, of course, when we got married. And that dad, because I had planted an apple tree there, and that and dad holding on to it when they get bigger. And they finally had apples apple on it. Uh, Joe is just a little guy, and I think he was in some of these pictures too. But that is dad when he was pretty young. And that's, they, uh, they had a logging camp across the river from McMurdo Station, you know where that is. And we had to go down the channel, there was no road down there, so go down the channel. And we, then I worked in the bush to put those logs down where they could get at them. We, we, we logged them up in the mountain up there and then hauled them with those sloops like you see down here where they could take them away and then they took them south of Parson and dumped them off and that's a picture so that when the water came up they would float down to the mill. Uh, they put logs down there that way a lot uh, but it was all done with no road on the ice you know and uh, of course we had experiences. I, I, I went down to McMurdo Station to haul some equipment home from a logging camp it was a big team and they kept breaking through too late in the spring. Had an awful trip home, got back into park at 8 o'clock at night and soaking wet, the harness was wet. Uh, and of course, that dad and Bob and Joe is halfway back bringing home the Christmas tree. <laughs> oh, Parson store, I don't think those buildings are there at all anymore. That's the warehouse that used to be right at the corner of the road that goes across the river and the garage is up the road towards the store below the road. That was just a warehouse. And, uh, I thought it was funny, that's, that's what your uh, lumber market that's used a, to be. That, that's a set of horse sleighs there, but there that must be, that wasn't mine, that was to go down the road somewhere because they used four runners on the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see, that's, that's where the lumber market used to be. I see there's boards on there, there's two by fours or whatever on that yeah, sleigh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now two by fours go to Japan. <laughs> yeah, there was a great sale for that kind of stuff because building was going on. And across the prairies in those days, they had wooden granaries, and that was a great sale for lumber, you know, because they didn't stand up very well, not very long, and uh, so they had to rebuild them every year. So it was a great sale for lumber. And that is the mill. The mill burned down in 1940, and that had taken in 41 after they built it. I, I didn't stay there. The fire was in May, and I went to work for the forestry because old Tom told me if they'd work free, uh, he'd get them a job when they got the mill going again. Well, I need money to send home. And I, I didn't feel like working free. I couldn't do it, couldn't afford to. And he, I helped at home all my working years when I was young. And that is the reason that I, I don't drink today at all. I sent every cent home, and Dave Pedley, I was in camp with him, and he saved every cent to marry Etty. And uh, so neither one of us, the Swedes and the people out of the camp would come home and get polluted, you know, and we never did that. At least we had what clothes we needed. Once they got drunk, they couldn't afford to buy clothes and didn't have any money or anything. You know. uh, but anyway, it was, it was a hard life, but it was. But that was somebody was going to take that down the road somewhere. Because the road, you run straight on Valley Road all the time. And that's uh, Weary Willie and Terry, a fellow named Jim Patterson and Chris Hines. He had a family between the Wellstead Place and Dad's Hatch Place down back in the corner. He had a little place in there. And he, he had a big family, a big family. And you know, in Depression times, I wondered what they'd ever do with a big family. And he had a grown up family too, part, part of the family, grown up, working south. One of the sons with the section foreman at Luxor, at Edgewater, down below. And he went, they were deer hunting, him and another fellow were hunting deer, and the fellow behind him 
had a thirty thirty running behind him with thirty thirty, and they must have, the hammer must have snagged on the rush or something, and uh, yeah, pulled the trigger back, the gun went off and sh killed the fellow in front. Yeah, and that Jim Patterson, him and I were going to go Harvard on the Prairie in nineteen thirty nine, but he, I was working and he was doing something else, but. He bought some logs in Edgewater, and so he went to Edgewater. But those logs are up on our place, and they in what fields now, and that shows you a nice size they were. Cause they, that was a flat deck truck, and they hauled them down the park. Yeah. Yeah. You can see they got change on the truck map. Right? But that's the Alton Barns from just just that's the main road, and. The fellow from Lux who was on that grader, uh, and they only plowed it once a year. But that's cow barns, and the, this here is a horse barn. But this here is cow barns and hay in the top. They had cattle there for the they supplied milk for the camp. And uh, the camp in the bush, he, he sent out a milk cow and two little pigs in the fall to the wee little pigs. And they, he, would, he knew what he was doing because they, we had fresh milk all winter from that fresh cow. And those little pigs, they felt all the scraps of little pigs. In the spring they were big, you know. Now it's criminal, the food that's thrown away here is terrible. Can't do much about it. But that fellow there is a retired Mountie. And he was 25 years in the Mounted Police. And then he, he was still in good shape so he got a job with old Tom. But he says he drove the first Mountie wagon in Fort St. John in 1905. So he had quite a history. Very interesting fellow. He was Irish, I guess. We'd served 25 years in the mountains. So. And he was still in good shape. See, he, he was 50 years old when that was taken or so. But it's testing. And that little Swede, Bernard Carlson, what they're doing is sharpening the axe. Yeah, I see the saws on the building. That's a bunkhouse. It was down the river across from, about across from Dad Place. Mm-hmm. About across from there. And that's the bunkhouse there. And that's the cross cut saws. That's what they cut logs with, of course. And that's the bunkhouse we lived in. And the foreman, and uh, they, you had to have a scaler. They lived in a little shack close by. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all wooden roofs. If they had had steel roofs, they'd have been up there yet. But the roofs were and of course, everything else. Mm -hmm. This logging camp too, though? That's, a, that's a, in the same country. It might be the same one. Uh, it's up back of Parson, that particular, particular bridge. Up, uh, up the creek. Uh, and this, this too, that's the same picture, that's the same guy there. And that's the bunkhouse there. Oh, that is the barn. And that's a bunkhouse right there. But that is the barn there. They, they've been shoveling the manure out and the snow on top of it, so it looks like awful deep snow. But, uh, it was quite a life, eh? I 